Well, if you've been traveling with us, we have been working through a series that we are calling What to Say. We've been going with Paul's missionary journeys as our base because there's a lot of times that you get asked a question about your faith or about God and you don't know what to say. And so we've said this each and every week and then a couple weeks we added a little bit to it. And this is what we've been saying. Knowing what to say isn't the same as having the right answer but you do need to know your content. And so what that means is that just because somebody asks you a question and you don't have the answer, it doesn't mean that you just look at them blankly and don't have everything to say, anything to say. And you might not have the exact answer about faith that they're looking for, but it certainly helps to know about God in order to help have a conversation. And we've said if you're not sure what to say, you can follow these four steps in order to maybe have a good conversation. You ask the question behind the question, and that's highlighted because that's going to be a big part of today. Then you share a biblical truth. That's part of the knowing what you're talking about part. Uh, Share a personal experience and and ask a good follow-up. So many tough questions get dodged because people are scared, or you try to overcompensate with an answer to look smart when really, if you initiate a conversation and dig into what that person is thinking, that might be what they're looking for and could lead to something great. Now this morning, we've got a great story of Paul going to Ephesus, and a lot of things happen. We don't have time to cover them all, but as we cover the part that we're going to cover today, there's a couple of things we just need to understand before we get into the story. There's actually quite a bit of sort of in the middle backstory that we need to cover in this particular passage. And so here is something that we need to understand the difference between before we go any further this morning. It's the difference between a riot and a revolution. Two things that can feel chaotic. Two things that uh, bring disorder to something that may have felt or been orderly. But two things that are completely different in their nature. Typically, a riot is something that's spontaneous, unorganized, and localized, whereas A revolution is a little more planned. It's coordinated. It might not happen in a back room, and it might start off quickly, but it's usually something that's been happening for a long time, and it stretches a long ways. A riot is often an immediate emotional reaction, whereas revolution is often caused by a prolonged emotional reaction or a response to something that's happening. Riots are typically short-lived. Uh, Their disruption comes via fear and anger with no real lasting change. Whereas a revolution is long-term, the disruption comes via transformation, not fear, and that you hope that there's lasting change at the end of a revolution. At a riot, it's often focused on an individual or a small group of people, whereas a revolution is focused on something that benefits everybody. And finally, a riot has a leader who often fights for themselves or their losses, where a revolution fights for others regardless of the cost. Now, this is really important, particularly in today's context, but this was a big deal in Ephesus as well. Now, the city of Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey today, it survived various wars, uprising, people coming in, people coming out. And then in 133 B.C., it came under Roman rule. And as that city, it was the capital of Asia Minor, and then it was only second in its greatness to Rome, in part because of the temple that we are about to talk about within it, which was one of the wonders of the ancient world. This was a highly regarded city. It was a trade center. There was a lot of people. It was a very important hub for everything in that area of the world. And this is where Paul finds himself. So let's read from Acts 19. It says, About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. The way being uh, the message of Jesus. Now, anytime we see something that says about that time, and you see that we're already in verse 23, you know I've skipped a whole bunch of the chapter. So here's what you've missed. First, Paul gets to Ephesus and spends three months reasoning in the synagogues. God bless Paul. Everywhere he goes, he says, I'm so done with the Jews, and then he goes and tries anyways. I just love how he just doesn't give up. I love that about Paul. But he spends three months, and finally, as it happens everywhere else, they kick him out. So 
uh, he starts to lecture for two years at the Hall of Tyrannus. Okay, so he's in this hall, he's, he's lecturing, he's discussing daily about Jesus and the Messiah, talking about how it fulfills the, uh, the Scripture and the Torah, but also talking about the message and how it's different this time and much different than anything that they would be hearing in Ephesus. And then there's a small story there about a small group of Jews who go and they try to imitate what Paul's doing. They try to uh, cast out demons in the name of Jesus through Paul, even though they don't really believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And in there, there's a story of a demon who comes out and actually talks to those people who, 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 are, who are trying to imitate Paul and says, like, I'm not scared of you. I know that you're just making this up and you're doing this for yourself. And that scares them so much that a bunch of them actually convert. (laughs) And they start to follow Jesus. That's a cool part of the story as well if you wanted to go backwards. Okay, let's keep going. A silversmith named Demarius who made silver shrines of Artemis brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. Okay, now we have to stop again because we have two more people to introduce or, yeah, two more people to introduce to this story. First, uh, Demetrius, sorry, I think I said Demarius. Demetrius, he's a silversmith who made idols of the Greek goddess Artemis. And he's an industry leader, so uh, we see that he gathers a whole bunch of the other people that do this together to try to form a plot. So we feel like this person is likely the leader of all of these other people who make these idols. They make handmade idols that represent Artemis, the goddess Artemis, and they sell them to people. And of course, the temple of Artemis is in Ephesus. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And so this is very, very big business. And Paul is disrupting that business, and so he gathers them all together. Now, Artemis, she is a Greek goddess. She's the Greek goddess of fertility and motherhood. She's a little softer than a lot of her counterparts, known a little bit more as the lovey kind, known for more of a giving life type of thing than destruction. And there is a temple to Artemis, and it's massive. It's one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was only recently discovered a couple of hundred years ago by accident in an archaeological dig. It was founded in around 18... Uh, or 800 BC, and then it flooded. It was an area that flooded a lot of times, and it just kept getting buried and buried in sand. And then a few hundred years later, they rebuilt it again, and they rebuilt it out of uh, marble. They put it on a base that was a little softer, knowing that that area was prone to earthquakes. They, They tried to engineer it so that it could move when the ground shook, and it took 100 years to build. And here's how big it was. With 127 columns, that were 60 feet high. The building was 377 feet across or 115 meters and 46 meters or 151 feet wide. It took 100 years. It was made out of marble. It was massive. It was huge, okay? And then it burns down. Why does it burn down? Well, there's a handful of different stories. But what the Greek lore will tell you is that uh, Artemis was distracted that day because she was looking over the birth of Alexander the Great. And she wasn't in her temple. And because of that, her temple was vulnerable and was allowed to be burned down. And so later, Alexander the Great would come back through Ephesus and see this amazing temple and commission its rebuilding in 356. And it would be generally, it would be, uh, you know, damaged here and there, but it would generally be used for the next three or four hundred years until finally it was decommissioned and started to crumble and then turned into a quarry for other buildings in the area. What I'm saying is, this was a big deal. These weren't little idols to like an offshoot religion or something small. When you've got a temple that is one of the wonders of the ancient world and that business is being disrupted, there are going to be people that are upset about it. And that is what we see in Demetrius. He called them together along with the workers in related trades. And he said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. He receives a good income. This is the first fear. There's going to be another one, but this is where we start. And you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. So he's been there for a little over two years 
And he's made some headway. People are starting to follow Jesus. People are starting to follow the way, so much so that it's actually starting to disrupt the norm. He says that gods made by human hands are not gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade would lose its good name. Once again, he leads with himself. But also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be desecrated and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. They're very upset. So what are they going to do about it? So this group of people that are all building these idols, they get together. And when they heard this, they were furious and they began to shout, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon, the whole city was in an uproar. In a lot of versions of your Bible, this word uproar will be translated into the word riot. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. So they all gather together. They have whipped up the crowd and this giant group of people, this riot has now formed, chanting, great is the goddess Artemis. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they've all traveled into this theater. And Paul, who sees a crowd, wants to go talk to them. Hey, here's a group of people I can tell about Jesus. And his friends go, I don't think that's... Hey, look, there's a time and a place. We really appreciate what you're doing here. But he says, Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Not only that, even some of the officials of the the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture in to the theater. One of those moments that sometimes you want to do uh, a good thing, but it's good to have good friends around you that just hold you back just for a minute and make you think about it. As the assembly was in confusion, obviously, because everybody's there and they're yelling and I don't know what's going on and why is this even happening. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. That sounds a lot more like a riot than a revolution to me. The Jews, never trying to lose an opportunity to expunge themselves of any blame, The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and they shouted instructions for him. And he motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. So what he wants to go is go, hey, 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 (laughs) just so you know, this isn't us. It's not, Paul. yeah, is Paul Jewish? Yeah, 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 yeah. But this isn't us. So mm, just don't worry about, this this isn't us. So don't be mad at us. But when they realized he was a Jew, and also didn't worship Artemis, which is what they're all shouting about. They all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So then the city clerk, the one in charge of the city, right? So the Romans would have put people in charge of the provinces of the city. They're on Roman rule, but there's local officials they are governing. And so the city clerk gets up in the crowd and he says, fellow Ephesians, meaning I'm one of you, Doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. So here's a local official trying to give a little bit of context and quell the riot because there's nothing worse for a local government than a riot where most of the people don't even know why they're there in the first place. Then, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are pro and they can press charges. He's saying, these people feel unjust. They've whipped you up into a frenzy. There is a path for these people to make themselves whole. So I would encourage you to encourage them to do that instead of this. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. It must be organized. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting. We. So now you've got a city official representing the Ephesians going, we are being 
uh, we, are being in, we are in danger of being charged by the Romans of creating a riot. And we really don't want that. So, in that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion. Nobody knows why we're here, since there's no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. This is a great story. There's so many pieces and parts in it, and I wish we had all day to dig into it. But as we dug through it this week, and we were so blessed to have uh, George in with us this week as we were prepping uh, our content, we put a bunch of stuff up on the board, and we were trying to see the through lines and, and figure out what it was. And the, the themes of order and chaos came up. The themes of uh, the truth versus deception came up. The ideas of, of what was really happening and, and how do we learn from this is really what we were digging into. And so here's some of the things that we came up with just quickly uh, for you to think about today. In Ephesus, the truth was disrupting the system. And those who stood to lose the most shouted the loudest. Right? Everybody knows this story. You've all either been on one side of this argument, probably, or the other. A moment where you saw somebody being wronged, or you yourself was wronged, and you uh, were wronged, and, and you started maybe just a mini-riot. You know, riots don't have to be thousands of people. Sometimes it's three people in the lunchroom before they go back out into the office. There's a lot of different ways these things can form. But here's what happened when the truth of the message of Christ, of the way, came into their system. It was disruptive. And any time the truth comes into a place where the truth isn't living right now, it's disruptive. That's what happens. That's why you get so many questions sometimes that you don't know how to answer. Because almost everything you do and the way you live and the things you believe disrupt the social norms of everything around you. It's why you even start to say, I don't know what to say. So here was the truth. The truth is the message of Jesus made all people valuable and deserving of grace. And that belief in Christ could lead to fear being cast aside. Okay, In the the ancient world, uh, there wasn't a lot of value in the person. It was a lot easier to control you, as it is today, for you to live under fear than grace. It's a lot easier to manipulate people's emotions when they get you angry at each other. And what Paul's message was, was there are certainly things that you are called to repent of. Steps to take. But the world isn't as you see it. This world isn't hopeless. You actually have value and belief in Jesus can lead to your fear being cast aside. Here's what the deception was. The deception was that people needed to protect themselves against the gods and each other because chaos could arrive at any moment. Who feels that way? Who do you know that feels that way? I think if we're telling the truth, we all feel that way in certain moments. Maybe more so in some situations than others, but the reality is is that we're dealing with a lot of the same things that the church in Ephesus was dealing with then, and that the message of Jesus is just as disruptive as it is now, maybe in a different way, but it's dealing with the same. So what do you say? What do you say when truth and deception look the same? This is a question that everybody's asking themselves right now. If something is online, first of all, is it legitimate or was it made up? Is it AI or is that a real person? Second of all, does that blue check mark beside their name actually mean that this thing is real? Third, uh, are these news organizations, regardless of whether you're left-leaning or right-leaning, it doesn't matter, this is a holistic conversation from right here, is, is, is those, are those organizations you know, actually calling it down the middle? Or are they leaning one way or are they leaning the other way? What does that look like? How do we tell the difference between truth and deception? They were dealing with the same thing in Ephesus. This new message comes in, one of hope and of value for people, one of grace and restoration, one where you don't need to fear not purchasing an idol and putting it in your home. 
because the world was so much bigger than that and the God that created it was so much more caring than that. So how do you answer this question? There's a lot of different ways to do it, but here's the challenge that I would give you, the way that uh, you could ask yourself. Tyler was so excited about it that he gave you a sneak peek about 90 seconds ago. It says this, who are you protecting? This is a great way to get the heart of truth versus deception of almost anything you're hearing right away. Stop and ask the question, who are you protecting? Are you protecting yourself? Are you protecting your own um, whatever you want? Is it a small group of people that it benefits? Or are you protecting a large group of people? Are you not thinking about yourself as you put forward for other people? Okay? Here's another way to think about it. Does that protection require a riot or a revolution? They look the same. They're both very disruptive. Some of them, both of them can last a long time. They're very emotional. They can get loud. They can divide people. Chaos and order often look the same. Riot and deception often look the same. So a great question to ask yourself would be, who am I protecting? And does that requ protection require a riot? Does it require me to get angry at somebody else? To get other people angry at other people? Does it require me to make up a story? Or to convince people that because I'm lying, I'm, it doesn't really matter because it's actually for the greater good? Does it require me to prey on people's fragile state? Or does it require something bigger than that? Something that regardless of what happens to me, those people are doing better. Now here's the tough part about riot and revolution. The best revolution that we've ever seen and that we will ever see was when Christ came and lived his life and died and rose again, defeated death, lived a life sinless, showed grace and mercy and love to the people that he saw, to the least of these, as well as people who are very well off. In Christ's revolution, nobody is supposed to get left behind. Because we're flawed, because the world is just inherently flawed in certain ways, there's no way for us to create a revolution that doesn't actually lead somebody behind. I don't care if you're a conservative or a liberal or you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. You look at the nature of everything that we're looking at right now and the rhetoric and the anger and the fear and the hate and the this versus that person and you can absolutely make the argument that if we get this person in office instead of this person, that this group of people will be better off. But the reality is we can never create anything that goes this people will be better off and so will these people. We try, but only Jesus was able to do that. Now I'm going to say one more thing and then we'll get out of here. Uh, we'll pray and then we're going to take communion together. And that's this. It's really a easy to get self-righteously angry, okay? We're in the most divided culture we've ever been in a lot of different areas. We're politically divided, we're socially divided, we're religiously divided. And a lot of times the people around us incite fear or anger or hate to try to convince us of something. Jesus didn't do that. And as Christians... We are to present that message also without doing that. And there are people that you'll look at and you'll go, well, they believe what I believe and like it doesn't really matter how they act because they believe what I believe. And Jesus went, that's not actually good enough. That's, that's only part of the picture. There are people that you can look at and go, well, they're going to make a change. It's going to make a difference. And you can go, yeah, it is. But you're looking at this group. You're forgetting about the group that's getting left behind. Maybe because you're not a part of it. 
Maybe because you haven't identified it or haven't seen it, or quite honestly, you're just sick of hearing about it. I don't know what it is. But if we look at things through the lens that Christ looks through, revelation means nobody gets left behind. And that's tough. And in our human world, it's going to be impossible for us to capture that all the time, which is the tension that we hear and that we feel, which is why it's hard to know what to say. Which is why when you don't know what to say, I just want you to engage in the conversation. Because knowing what to say isn't the same as having the right answer. But you do need to know your content. You need to know who Jesus was and why he came and how he served and what he taught. And you need to look at his disciples who tried to do everything they could to emulate that as well. And that's our goal. And it's hard. And it's disruptive. And often it requires you to sacrifice yourself for the needs of others. And we should pray that we have the strength and the wisdom to do that whenever we can. We should pray for our leaders, whether it's in a local church or in a ward counselor or a mayor or an MPP or an MP, both of which were in the building in the last couple of weeks. We should pray that the way Jesus led us to be is the way that we can lead to. And so as we continue to navigate all of the things that we're navigating, which sometimes feels impossibly difficult. Think about what they were dealing with in Ephesus. Consider how Paul approached this and consider Paul's example of Jesus and how he was taught to as well. Ask yourself a couple of questions and make sure that you're looking beyond yourself to care for those who need it as well. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for Paul's continued tenacity to go through the Roman world, to teach people about you in that first century under criticism, under fear of being beaten or arrested. As Mark talked about last week, God, as a, as a person who was personally feeling beaten down and in despair in moments, God, we, we pray that you would surround us with your strength and your wisdom. That we would be able to be the light and the hope that Christ was. That we would find ways during complicated moments to show the grace and the mercy and the love and the wisdom and the truth about the world that he brought to us that we wouldn't be afraid to share hard truths about redemption and restoration and our need for a Savior, but Lord, that we would do that in a way that showed love and grace, that we would walk with people and care about them. In Jesus' name, amen.